Hey, and welcome to the next Docs Who Lift podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Spencer Nadolski. I got my co-host here, Dr. Carl Nadolski Jr. It's the first yeah. time we're doing video. We're going to put this on YouTube now from now on since we had that request. We also need to get a jingle. So uh, people are like, hey, you need an intro sound. So ba da ba 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 <laughs> I, I would, I, there's one one specific uh fellow endocrinologist uh doc who lifts uh dr boyt guinto who uh wants to uh help with this and maybe he we can hire him to be our tech guy we're docs we're docs who lift we lift lots of weights <laughs> Woo! yeah nah, i don't know yeah all right dr guinto we're calling you out all help right okay it. this Episode was going to be the first episode. We actually do a Q&A. We get lots of Q, uh, Qs, questions, and uh, we're going to start doing this every month or two. And just, you know, some good questions that come to us that we can riff off uh, between other podcasts. So it's good stuff. So uh, who, who is this Q&A from? You had a- All right. So, yeah, this was a very specific request from a Dr. Razan Alif, who is a family practice physician in Florida. Uh, with a with a great background, um, uh, but uh, did uh, actually I guess in internal medicine. I'm sorry, she's a primary care doctor. She did internal medicine residency at FAU, <clears throat> and uh, she has a, a lot of interest in lifestyle as medicine. And so she was very interested in our approach and wanted to talk to us about a few little things about you know lifestyle, exercise, weight loss. Etc. Um, she is two years into practicing as a primary care physician, really enjoying it. She says that uh, you know it, it didn't take her long to realize how the majority of the chronic medical problems that we all face really can be attributed to you know lifestyle, at least lifestyle efforts, choices, history. Obviously, we talk about you know there are a lot of other complicating factors. Um, but that's what she uh, specifically asked about, you know, what we eat, how we spend our days, exercise, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, depression, poor body image, et cetera. Um, she started referring to registered dietitians, um, but was struggling with commercial insurance coverage for that, um, which we all uh, really kind of have issues with. Um, Medicare, you know, is not uh, cooperating that great. And a lot of them have to pay out of pocket. They get turned off altogether, et cetera. And so she just wanted us to go over uh, a few things. Uh, we talk about a lot of these things uh, frequently, but um, just a few specifics that we can just uh, kind of talk through and hopefully help out not only uh, other primary care physicians, dietitians, but obviously also patients, because I think uh, they might be the majority of our, our audience. Yeah. And it, either way, we can spin it. We can spin the lens whatever way we want to talk into phys- uh, physicians or patients. So yeah, let's, uh, let's go over the question. Yeah. So one of the nuances she specifically uh, mentioned was, you know, different backgrounds and ethnicities. So different people come from all different uh, backgrounds, preferences, ethnicities, et cetera. And so we, we really have to understand those and, and help patients improve their lifestyle efforts with, within those contexts, because otherwise, you know, we that's we just got to do that. It's personalization, right? Yeah. So um, number one, <clears throat> her number one question was how to instill some accountability with patients and identify the people who may actually need therapy to say address binge eating disorders, sticking to a diet plan, um, staying motivated. Um, she has some follow up questions from that, like do you use apps like Noom? Um, which we, some of us have experience with, um, and then goes on to talk about how patients lose some weight, but then plateau. And then of course, uh, she used the term rebound. We could talk about relapse with weight. So this, I would say we should address this from all different aspects, not just obesity, but you know, the obesity complications and other, um, dietary lifestyle issues that, that can affect chronic disease. So, so first of all, accountability. What do you, what do you think about, you know, trying to figure out work on accountability with patients? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. So, you know, we can go over the social determinants of health and how some people have access to uh, all the way up to personal chefs, Mm -hmm. personal trainers. They can have a huge gym in their house and have every resource 
uh, at their disposal versus other people who maybe work a couple jobs to get by, who have to take the bus to work, who don't have any childcare, who can barely afford uh, anything like that and has to go, um, <laughs> you know, to a, to the local, you know, convenient mart to get any type of food. It's the food desert concept that we hear yeah, about. So it depends. And again, you know, I just, I actually just did a post, uh, a meme today. It's the post of, um, it's Game of Thrones. You don't watch Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. It's all, it's been, it's been done for a few years anyway, but it's Khaleesi. Uh, sh- shows her kind of miserable there. But oh, I, yeah. I, I, sh- I shared it even though I don't know Game of Thrones because of the concept. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You, you <laughs> don't even have to know. It's just, it's like so, uh, a, a woman sitting there just looking super distressed and tired. And basically, the, the personal trainer, after telling him, you know, we have the same 24 hours in a day and she has a couple kids at home and telling her, yeah, to work out over five hours a week and meal prep every single uh, meal. And there's, there's no excuses. So we, we have to just meet our patients or clients or whatever you want to say, if you're a dietitian coach, or if you're a patient, we have to, we have to meet each other where you're at. So in terms of like ethnicities and backgrounds, I'll never forget. I was at a CrossFit uh, box one time listening to uh uh, one of the coaches talked to, it was a Mexican family and saying, oh, you eat corn? I'm like no more corn. And they're kind of like, they, I, I saw their eyes gloss over. Like they couldn't have the tortillas anymore. Yeah. Like, first of all, corn tortillas, if you look at them, uh, you know, in a small, like taco size or a little bit bigger, soft corn tortilla, they're actually low in fat, low in calories. You know, they have, uh, you know, 10 grams of carbohydrates, but one or two grams of fiber. Pretty decent. They're probably not the cause of all the problems. They're it's not the cause. Like fruit. And yeah, that's probably not our biggest issue. So but. probably shouldn't should have like met that person where they are. So I think number one, meeting people where they are, uh, you're gonna help like we can't force people to do anything. I think understanding that when somebody comes to a primary, so this is what I, I, I learned. Primary care was very different than once I went to an obesity specialty position. Mm-hmm. Primary care, you're getting everybody coming in, you're screening them for obesity and overweight. You're screening them for some of these, uh, metabolic disorders. And then you're trying to ask permission to discuss this. And then you're advising if they give you permission. Yeah. And if you have time, that's the problem. Cause then it just, then there's so many different things in primary care. Primary care is not being supported the way we need to, but that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> actually miserable. So that's why I'm not doing it anymore. But uh, I empathize because I was I was there once. So you got to go through all those things. So now being an obesity specialist, those things are already implied. That those those people are coming to me. They're bought and they're ready to make the change. So other people, you know, accountability. You, you just don't force them uh, to do it. That's a whole motivational interviewing thing. You roll with with resistance. You don't push back and tell them that you know you're going to die, right? If you don't change, you discuss. Ask them if they understand. Uh, their, their disease state and, and risk. And then if they want to learn more, you give them more and that's where they start buying in. And that's where the accountability comes in. But we could also go down the whole route of, if you have a coach, if like, so we are just uh, the post that I did today, it was a dietitian that says that diets just don't work. And it's like, well, okay, we have these intensive lifestyle behavioral randomized controlled trials. But these are intense trials. It's intensive behavioral yeah. therapy. It's not just giving them a, a diet book and being like, okay, be accountable to this. It's, it's, um, so if you have access, and so that goes into yeah. Uh, yeah. insurances not paying for an RD. And I don't know if they should pay or not. I, I'm, I go back and forth, like, and I know you do too. Like, should insurance just pay for everything or should we strip it down, right. make it bare minimum to where like then, then each commercial uh, or doctor's office could make things lower cost? Yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. Whole nother discussion. Yeah, so that's a that's a tough one for accountability sure. Accountability stuff. Yeah, and 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 you know the other thing with accountability, I'll bet you you I don't think we've ever talked about this, but I have plenty of patients who say I need the accountability. Yeah, I need someone to tell me what to do, and if you do that, it'll hold me accountable. And then there are those who don't want to be pushed too hard, and so I think making sure there's some sort of open dialogue. And I don't know if we have evidence on this, honestly. I don't know if there's any study on this. To be honest, we should look for it, but. I think it just always comes back to personalization. Patients will often tell you. So if you're a patient out there listening, think about this. How do you want to be held accountable? Do you need 
more frequent follow-up? Do you need monitoring? Um, you know, some, I tell patients based upon these studies you're talking about, the more frequently we have some sort of interaction with the coaches, dietitians, us, that's, there's a lot of data to back that up. That's why a lot of the guidelines say, well, 14 or 16 sessions in the first six months, all that stuff. But on the other hand, that might be stressful. I mean, it, it stresses me out just thinking about if I had to go do that. And so people might not have time, they might not have the, the desires, and they might not have the need. I mean, you and I have both had tons of people who talk to us about their diet and ex exercise. We come up with a personalized plan and they just go do it. Yeah. They just need someone to give them some guidance and sometimes medication or whatever it is. And they just go do it. Others really do need the frequent follow-up and the, and the accountability. And they, they always tell me, I don't even have to say anything. So, so if your patient's out there, I would say, know that and talk to your physicians about it. Know what, what you think you need and physicians, dietitians, et cetera, out there know that there's a wide spectrum of potential needs and desires. And again, personalized therapy. Yeah. Like I have my own coaches, but again, that's, I charge like 150 or 175 a month for that. Not everybody can afford that. Yeah. Other people, you know, that's, and I try to create this comprehensive program, just like the look ahead trial, but like, who am I kidding? But some people just will not be able to afford that. And I'm, you know, I'm just being honest with that. It's, I, yeah. I don't know how to do the insurance thing. It's kind of a, head, a headache. Ideally we would bring that cost down to, you know, what somebody could afford and, you know, there's some people say, if you make it too cheap, people don't buy in and that type of thing. There's all sorts of issues here, but right. some people, and that can go either way. Again, the different people will respond differently. That does actually bring us to uh, a part of her next question was, do you recommend any apps like Noom? Well, there are free apps out there that people like to use that they feel like do hold them accountable. I think the most popular one in my patient population is uh, MyFitnessPal, yeah. but we definitely have people using the Noom stuff. I've heard pros and cons. I haven't personally done it. I think you have some with it. Maybe um, some of the big pharma companies have, you know, bought into that to help patients in some other way for the accountability. Exactly that, since we don't have the, all the resources to do it. But um, I yeah. think you actually have a little bit more personal experience looking into it. But. I've had, I, I don't know. Now I have close to like three or three hundred or four hundred new like patients now through this uh, telemedicine program, we ask them everybody what they've done. And I, most of them have tried Noom. They, in, in fact, I'd say 90% have done Noom and very small percentage have actually liked it. It's, it's a, it's a calorie tracker. Plus you get some very hands-off coaching. And then they basically tell you to eat 1200 calories, everybody. And it's really weird. It's not personalized. So uh, in my opinion, I could, I have my own curriculum of what I tell people with you know, what, what the reasonable evidence is about weight loss. You can listen to our, our other podcasts of like yeah. the perfect diet for weight loss. You can just listen yep. to that and you'll be pretty much good. Um, and then a lot of the data shows points to just self-tracking. And that goes to what my brother said of my fitness pal is free. You got lose it. You have some other ones that are actually kind of this, uh, artificial intelligence. I can't, I really like this one macro factor. I think, you know, Greg Knuckles and um, yeah. Wexler. These guys are like, they're no, like Greg Knuckles is a strength athlete. He's a very mathematically minded person. And they, they made this app to where it's like a calorie tracker, but it gives you some idea of how many calories you eat based off your metabolic rate. And it's based on your change of uh, just brilliant guys. These guys are brilliant. I, I'm, I'm actually jealous. They... <laughs> They develop it in, in terms of like how much weight you lose. They can kind of see what your, your metabolic rate is and then how to adjust your calories and macronutrients. Um, yeah, we should get them on and talk about it sometime. Yeah, we should. I, I, I'm I, I, I wish I could buy some equity in their, in their, cause I think, <laughs> I really think their, their app is going to do well, but so there's things like that, um, that, that are very good too. So I, I personally just tell people to use, lose it or, or my fitness pal, if they want a little bit more guidance with their calories, um, you know, you could hire one of my coaches, but if you want something cheap, like whatever it is, 10, 15 bucks a month, and you don't want to, you don't need that extra, the, the coach is good for like strategizing around your lifestyle. Right. Yeah. So, and that's, I use my dietitians for that in my yes, program. Exactly. So you have a dietitian that can help like, for example, the mother of, of two who's working a job or two, and you got to eat this many calories. And you got to eat this many macronutrients or some range of it. 
it doesn't help you to strategize around that. Like, hey, why don't we try some frozen foods or meal replacements at this time? And then maybe I could help you look at the menu of this when you order out or whatever. That's kind of the strategy. So, um, but if you want something cheap, my fitness pal, lose it. Um, they have some premium versions. I don't think you need. And then if you want some more guidance, I, I, I like the macro factor um, uh, interface. So, yeah. And, and certainly that, you know, data do support all these different, you know, technologies to help with some of this accountability, uh, you know, it's whether it's phone calls from the clinic, uh, texts, these different apps, it, you know, people are actually studying these and it, they do look beneficial when people utilize them. So yeah. um, there's something to it. Um, you know, part of the, her other question was, and we could make a whole podcast about this and we've touched it uh, on it with our diets and stuff, but, um, you know, she, she talked about figuring out who specifically needs uh, therapy for like binge eating disorders. And, um, you know, so briefly there, there are some criteria, but you know, I, I personally essentially just ask people, you know, one, I'll just ask them straight up. Cause they'll usually know, they know what it means. If they feel out of control, if they do it in secret, um, if they, you know, if they feel addicted to food, if they, uh, eat so much that they're uncomfortable and then they feel guilty. Th those are some of the, the things. And we should probably have a, a whole podcast on that. We can get, uh, Samantha Harris who wrote some, some recent papers on that. So she's, yeah, we should do a podcast all about, cause there's, there's TikTok. It's, it's horrible. There's the stuff that I see is just like, you don't even know what you're talking about. You're just making up, like you could beat binge eating by this, this, and this. I'm like, that's not evidence-based. What are you talking about? So there are specific DSM five criteria, but I agree with my, I actually agree with my brother that like, let's not uh, make this really stringent uh, criteria. You can see there's a spectrum of this type of uh, disordered eating. And you can just, you can just tell by the way some people discuss. And so for us, we, we, we screen people by just talking to them. Mm -hmm. um, you can give the DSM five, uh, uh, criteria and put that as a screener. Uh, it's whatever three out of the however many um, yeah. criteria. And and and, uh, and if you're a patient and these this sounds familiar and concerning to you, bring it up with your physician and and uh, you know make sure you get help because this is a serious thing. And I think we're under diagnosing it for sure. Yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy is absolutely number one. But again, I actually I don't know of too many psychologists that are uh, available specifically for binge eating CBT. Um, so that's tough. We, yeah. we're not psychologists, but we do the best we can. We do the best we can. And we have and access to medications, access to medication. So, so Pyramid I also uh, give a shot. I don't know if, uh, if she'll be listening to this, but I happen to have an all-star dietitian who is a specialist in disordered eating. So, uh, my dietitian, Emily Wells, if you're listening, here's your shout out. Um, I, I send a lot of patients her way and, uh, you know, I think we do a good job as a team. I might steal her. I'll hear more than you. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll steal her from my program. Yeah. Oh, yeah she's awesome. awesome. I, have, I have a lot of good dietitians on my team. So. Yeah, that's good. That's All right. Good. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, the next question is very much related to the dietary stuff because she said, do you actually provide patients with diet plans? Some people really need a regimen which they stick to, or else they won't be able to be on their own. Many don't even know how to read nutrition facts, which in itself requires time to explain. Um, with that, do you recommend any books for people to read? Um, she's trying to gauge the amount of time required on, on her part as the physician uh, outside of the office visit and how to make the most of her time uh, with patients. So you and I both do the best we can with the time we have to give some, at least I do an initial dietary recommendation based upon what their sort of habits are, their struggles. We try to do a good dietary history. I know we, we actually had this discussion on doing a diet, you know, a dietary recall with patients. You don't like to do it as much. I like to talk to them and see what they think they're doing at least. Um, where they feel like their struggles are, some of the obvious things like, you know, sugary beverages, are they going out to eat? Do they think their dinners are heavy in like, you know, starchy calories or heavy in creams, oils, butters, fatty stuff? Um, and then, yeah, I try to give them a, a very personalized sort of idea based upon all the data that, that we've discussed that can be uh, a combination uh, of all the different evidence-based trials that are not mutually exclusive from cutting carbs, cutting fat, certainly making more whole food choices rather than refined choices, not eating out, 
changing sugary drinks to diet beverages, using meal replacement shakes, intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, all these things to personalize it. Going back to her first question, making sure we're, um, you know, the patients are okay with it based upon their preferences. Every guideline, by the way, says that, you know, the evidence is obviously based on on trials, but all guidelines with expert opinion say based upon personal preferences and ethnic backgrounds, et cetera. Yeah. I, you know, specific meal plan, like you need to eat 80 grams of chicken breast or whatever, you know, uh, and one cup of broccoli and however many grams of, yeah, no, I don't do that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't need, so I, I don't to do that. I can give template type of meals. Like here's an, here's a sample and here's kind of what would fit into your calorie macronutrient goal range. Here's the types of dietary pattern meals that would fit into what I think would work for you. Um, and, and, and so like, for example, uh, that the Mexican family, you, you go, okay, so we need to figure out what you're doing to, to lower your calorie intake. I'm not going to tell you you can't eat corn tortillas. That's ridiculous. So, you know, here, how are many eating during a meal? Are you using a lot of oil to cook the, the things in, you know, that type of thing, and maybe working back from there, but specific meal, uh, meal, uh, plans. I don't give specific ones. I give examples and then kind of give a meal template. And then sometimes it's, it's pulling back even further because sometimes it overwhelms the, the it's, it's too rigid. Um, you, you give them some examples of what can fit in within their calorie limits. And even that can be, su- that can be flexible seemingly, or it can be still too, uh, people get fixated on the numbers. So then you just kind of show them a dietary pattern to follow. And that's, that goes back into our our other podcasts of like, what's the best diet to follow. But as, as my brother said, you know, maybe teaching them about meal replacements, maybe even restricting time and when they eat and feed, and that's goes into the time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting discussion. But um, yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I think giving specific meal plans, you know, like you got the 21 day fix up, you got these other plans. They, it's like, yes, they can lick a few almonds out there. You have a, have a half of an apple slice, you know, that, They'll, they'll lose weight. I had just a patient that just did the, what's called like the 75 hard. They lost like 30 pounds in 75 days and regained it all back because it was a very set forth, uh, diet plan. And it's like, no, you, you, you gotta, it's behavior change. It's not just on, on the other hand, um, though, to patients often do want a little bit more of a specific dietary plan than even what a lot of dietitians will, will give them. So a lot of sometimes there's, we get caught up in philosophical things. Like you said, it is a lifestyle change. Right. A lot of, um, not to call out my dietitians, not mine, but just dietitians out there. A lot of times they're very passionate about helping patients change their lifestyle, but a lot of patients feel o- overwhelmed with that, I think. And they want a little bit more of a very specific meal plan. So again, going back to meeting the patient, if you're the patient meeting you where you want to be. And so I often do have to tell my dietitians, please help personalize this plan that we sort of specified, see how the patient responds to it and help them personalize it a little bit more. And sometimes they really, really want a very uh, stringent meal plan or something in between. So there's, again, there's a spectrum of desires and what they, what they need to do. And, you know, like all those big trials, we we go back to that and uh, adherence is generally the key. So we got to find a way to help them adhere to it. All right. What's the light? Do we have uh, how many more questions? <laughs> there are a few more, but the, the, her next one is actually about medications. And we're going to have a whole podcast yeah. on medications. Skip that one. Uh, huh? Skip. skip okay. Yeah. So, so uh, um, Dr. Alif, we're, we're going to skip that one. We're going to do a whole podcast on weight Maybe loss. Multiple. Medications. Maybe multiple podcasts. Probably. We probably have to do multiple. Sponsored, and, sponsored you know, by, my, uh, by my telemedicine company. <laughs> and it'll spill into other medications, I'm sure. Um, so then let's talk about the last one, because that's really important. And that is the exercise um, or physical activity. And she says, exercise seems to be an issue where most people will say they don't have time, don't know how, or don't want to. And this is a big deal. Um, because yeah, I think I think as a kind of a world where a lot of people in, in uh, different societies are struggling to get not only enough exercise, but just physical activity. You know, there's too much sedentary time, um, not enough moderate to intense real exercise, weight training. We're the docs who lift. This is our podcast. That's our whole point of this. You know, we want more people to pump some iron and uh, and get healthy. Exercise and physical activity 
aren't necessarily for weight loss per se. It's for the health benefits. So exercise, no matter which way you slice it, no matter what happens to your weight is good for obesity, obesity. I thought we did it for big pecs and biceps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're all really impressed. <laughs> for any of you people who watch Seinfeld. Yeah, for the, yeah, for the, but there, there's a body composition component, a health component, feeling better, improving better. Uh, mental health component, all of it. It's exercise is medicine. It's, I tell people, and this may not exactly be true, but I always say, look, I can't give you a medicine that's as good as exercise. That may not exactly be true <laughs> technically, but, um, but you know, certainly it's, it's a really good and important. So I guess I'll say what I do. So I, again, I'd kind of do sort of a, a recall, say, what is your day like? You know, are you sedentary or up and moving about what's, what's going on there? And do you get any exercise in aerobic weight training? And a lot of people are exactly what you said. They, they're busy. The mom that you had in your meme from uh, game of Thrones. Cause, and the 20 year old ripped personal trainer who works out all day long with his clients is like, no excuses. Well, it's hard drinking a gallon of water with a gallon walking around the gym. Yeah. Yeah. I personally say, look, you know, we got to find a way we got to find a way if they don't have a habit of exercise. I say, when is the little bit of time in any part of the day that you think could be the best time to get your habit in? And I say, this is my own personal thing. I say, let's, let's find five minutes and I don't care if you pretend to exercise and we're going to go start from there to, to make a habit. And then just like all the guidelines say, because of the great evidence is breaking up the sedentary time. So that's an easier thing to actually do. I think, I think, I don't know. What do you think of that? I don't know. You just got your hip replaced. So you're, you're able to move around a little bit better. It's, now, hey, it's been a year. So, yeah. So that now I can't move because of my other hip. The, the, the famous discussion, like, uh, something's better than nothing, right? There's yeah, yeah. something's better than nothing. You don't, you don't have to be all or nothing. Right. Um, some people don't understand that just once a week is better than zero times a week. Some people don't understand that five or 10 minutes is better than zero minutes. And I think that if you can understand that mindset, so I, I'm going to shill out for my lift RX thing. I developed this program for lifting weights to lower the barrier for people that are intimidated by the gyms. They don't have to do hours long of these crazy bodybuilding workouts. And in the group, it's, it's, we've gotten these people that have bought into this, this, this idea. And in fact, it's really cool because people go on vacation, Mount Kilimanjaro. So people are going to Mount Kilimanjaro. I don't, I don't even know. They're going on these hikes. Oh, why was that? I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> because it's John L. Smith. <laughs> oh, oh my God. That's Mount Kilimanjaro. That's a whole nother story. It's oh, God. Michigan state yeah. football coach, whatever. Uh, he, um, th- these people, they'll go on vacation. These uh, people in my lift RX group. And it's like, you know, I wasn't able to get in to the gym. But I did walk for 10,000 steps and it was, and I did hike and it's like, yes, that, that, that suffices. In fact, that's better than pretty much most people out there. So I think if people adopt that mindset, I do think that it's really hard in a primary care setting to give a whole lifestyle prescription if people don't understand. This is where you have to utilize some sort of technology and resources outside the clinic. And uh, if you're a physician listening, you could, you could video your own stuff, set up your own website. I did it. Um, and you don't have to pay a pretty penny. Uh, it, it doesn't have to, doesn't have to be, um, you know, um, too complex, but you can also find other, you know, strength coaches in the area that maybe you like, you can talk to your exercise physiologist. If you work in a hospital, if you're a patient out there though, listen to the, the people that have the highest mortality do zero, do zero physical activity. The most benefit in mortality, we talked about this, I believe in our first podcast, the benefit is by far that first, first step. So if you do that first step, the reduction in mortality is enormous. Then as you keep going, there's still a benefit as you go, but that first little bit is the biggest increment that uh, will benefit you. So if you can think about that, just something's better than nothing. Um, I think you're going to go a long way. Yeah. And then for Dr. Leaf, you know, what I try to do the best I can, if I have time, I do try to give patients based on their preferences and their time and whatever. I, I do talk about, um, you know, starting going for a walk and then we can add in some real basic upper body resistance training. Um, and sometimes we talk about push-ups and rubber band pulling exercises at home. If they have access and want to go to a gym, I often use the example of Planet Fitness's little circuit, 
where you do some pushing exercises and some pulling exercises. And you go through the little circuit. And I try to give them the best few minute basic education I can, and then hope we can go from there. And, and I really wish we had more access to exercise physiologists. Um, you know, there are personal trainers. Unfortunately, there's a wide spectrum of no offense to you guys, trustability, but also cost. You don't know what you're about to get. Right. I know that's the thing. There are some great ones out there. Yeah. And then I mean, there's some that are trying to make my, you know, 74 year old with obesity and, and bad knees and bad back do crazy things on a, on a ball with balancing one dumbbell up in the air. And it's like, what? No basics stick to the fundamentals and we'll progress from there. We can progress in volume, intensity, frequency, all that stuff, but we do have to start somewhere and, and, uh, breaking up sedentary time, walking as much as you can, if you can, um, being as physically active as you can is, is important. So, you know, just trying to emphasize that and the, and really the health benefits. I think if we emphasize that to patients, they, they usually get going a little bit better. Perfect. All right. Well, that's the Q and a episode for this, uh, the quarter. I don't know what you want to call this. But. Yeah. Well, we look forward to more, you know, uh, people out there, let us know. I promise you that we're going to answer all of them, but, um, we see some good ones out there that make for a good, uh, podcast episode. We will docs who lift you. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's it for this episode. Subscribe, tell your friends, share with a friend, share to everybody, share to the world, please ri- help us rise. <laughs> rise to the top of those charts so we can yeah, we want to be the champs those charlatans those quacks we can physically beat them but <laughs> yeah. we intellectually uh beat them that would be nice uh, intellectually i think we beat them but well, we want to help over ed- spread information good information we got to battle the misinformation that's our yeah you know, misinformation battle campaign all right thanks for listening thank you